The following special episode of Addressing Gettysburg is brought to you without commercial interruption by our Patreon page. Just go to patreon.com slash addressing Gettysburg so you can help support the show and keep it going and growing. Just go to patreon.com slash addressing Gettysburg and help us help you. That's patreon.com slash addressing Gettysburg. And we thank you in advance. Now on with the show. You're listening to Addressing Gettysburg. Thank you. Thank you, Pete, for that marvelous introduction. I uh, am somewhat speechless after that, but very grateful. And I'm grateful to see all of you here this afternoon. It's very heartening after the dark years of COVID to see such a wonderful turnout at the CWI. So thank you for being here. Welcome especially to the new attendees. Uh, it is an honor to be the first speaker at this year's Civil War Institute. Now, before I say anything else, I do have to give the typical U.S. Army disclaimer, which uh, you probably have heard before, uh, but it essentially says that uh, anything I'm about to say uh, cannot be used against me. No, anything that I'm about to say uh, is not representative of the U.S. Army, the Department of Defense, or the U.S. government, and uh, represents my views alone. Uh, and uh, now we're done with that, so we can move forward. Uh, a couple things that I would like to uh, just mention briefly up front before I, I jump right into the presentation. Uh, this, uh, this book I started working on about 15 years ago and it involved uh, an awful lot of archival research and a great deal of online research uh, made possible by the sesquicentennial. And uh, I was able to get into a lot of newspapers that otherwise would have been inaccessible to me. And for all the young and budding historians out there, I'd just like to offer a word of hope. There is so much available for you now that once was not. And take advantage of the online resources. You will find an immense amount out there and you can write on well-worn topics. Maybe not for your dissertation, listen to your PhD advisors, but uh, after a while you can write on what you really want to write about. For me, that was this topic. So what am I going to talk about today? I'm going to talk about the great du duo or the famous duo revisited, Robert E. Lee and Stonewall Jackson, and I'll encapsulate the major theses of my book. And briefly, there were four major theses of the Great Partnership. The first was that Robert E. Lee and Stonewall Jackson had a much deeper personal relationship than previously believed, and that that deep personal relationship was underpinned by a strong religious faith that they held in common. And then secondly, that this duo developed the best elements of Confederate strategy in the Eastern theater together, which may come as a surprise to some of you, but we'll talk about that. Thirdly, that Jackson himself was a strategic level thinker, maybe not a doer, but a thinker, uh, and uh, advised Lee on issues of strategy, perhaps more than we ever knew. And then lastly, that Jackson's death represented a strategic contingency point for the Confederacy, uh, a deep blow that many regarded at the time in the secessionist South as irreparable, uh, a catastrophic blow, if you will, even coming on the heels of the victory at Chancellorsville. So let's jump right into it. And those who have heard me speak before won't be surprised by this first slide. So we're gonna talk a little bit about theory. And to explain to you why we care about theory, I'm simply going to introduce this fellow, Carl von Clausewitz, who's up there in the, t in the top right. Uh, and uh, he is the founding father of Western military theory. Uh, Clausewitz was not yet translated into English from the German uh, by the time of the Civil War, but he represents the best in strategic thinking of the Western military tradition. And his foundational principle about war, the nature of war, is that it is policy by other means. Uh, in other words, no wars happen just uh, for killing's sake. They exist for some political purpose. 
This was grasped by both Robert E. Lee and Stonewall Jackson from the beginning, as indeed it was by almost all of the most famous of the military leaders of both sides. Uh, the little red stool represents the Army War College's famous ends, ways, means triad. And uh, Pete asked me to maybe mention a few things about what we do at the War College. Well, there we educate the armies and the countries and indeed many of our allies, future strategic level leaders. And strategy is about war winning and war losing. Uh, it's not about battles. It uh, is influenced by campaigns or the operational level, but it is not uh, about those lower levels. It's about why and how one loses and wins wars. To help us understand and grapple with this concept, we introduced many years ago, long before I came to the War College, this idea of ends, ways, and means. And quite briefly, ends represent your objectives or the primary goals for which one is fighting the war, very Clausewitzian in that regard. Your means are all the resources and all of the stuff that you have to fight wars with. Now, I would urge you to think beyond armies and navies and mines and railroads, which is what we Civil War people tend to think. Uh, also think about leaders. Leaders are finite means. There's only so many who can fight well at the strategic level, think well at the strategic level. And when that bench is exhausted, the side that has exhausted it is in trouble. Keep that in mind. The ways are the how to strategy. It connects the ends and the means. And in many ways, it is the essence of strategy. Uh, and it helps us understand how do you use the means to connect to the ends. Now, the reason I mention all of this is that Jackson and Lee understood the fundamentals of this. Even though this concept was invented many, many years later, they understood the concepts of ends, ways, and means, and in ways that may surprise you, particularly regarding Jackson's understanding of these concepts uh, in a fundamental sense. Below you see the little acronym DIME, represented by an actual dime. And this is another modern theory, but the antecedents in the American Civil War are quite extraordinary on both sides. And again, this duo of Lee and Jackson understood the basic premises, and that is that war is composed not just of fighting and not just of armies on the battlefields. Today, uh, fleets and air wings and in space and in the cyber domain also, but also uh, economic power, informational power, diplomatic power, the dime. And these two men were quite aware of the other instruments of national power that were at work in the American Civil War, and indeed that time was ticking against the Confederacy from the beginning of the conflict, and therefore something had to be done quickly in order to uh, fix this imbalance in what we would call the Confederate dime. Those are the three levels of war. Now, many of you, I think, may be familiar with this intrinsically, but for those who are not, let me review the strategic level is the war winning and war losing level. Who makes those decisions? Well, those are the presidents and their chief ministers, the cabinets in the American Civil War, but also they are advised by the primary military leaders, Robert E. Lee, Ulysses S. Grant, uh, for instance, uh, Henry Halleck even. And then the operational level, which as you can see, influences the strategic level of war. There we're talking about the great campaigns, uh, such as the Pennsylvania campaign, the Maryland campaign, and within those campaigns exist various finite tactical events, battles, skirmishes. The uh, Pennsylvania campaign was not just fought here at Gettysburg, as most of you know. It went on for over a month, started in Virginia, and it finished in Virginia. And indeed, uh, these tactical level events can start to move up towards the strategic level in their significance. And there are moments in time that I write about in the book, and those who, of you who have been with me on the staff rides understand, uh, where the tactical level can be so impactful that it not only influences the outcome of entire campaigns, but also the strategic level, the war winning and losing level of war. 
And there are examples of such places here at Gettysburg, such uh, locations, many of you know these, and there are such locations in the other battlefields of the Civil War also. This was an era in the 19th century when decisive battle was possible. You could still win decisive battles that had strategic level effect. We may be returning to that era uh, in the present day. Now the little triangle gives you a rough approximation of the levels of leadership that correspond with the levels of war. And as you can see there, the strategic level dips down to the tactical level, which means that occasionally you have to have a uh, army general or a theater commander, if you will, assume direct command of his forces, as Robert E. Lee did it several times during the American Civil War. That is necessary, but they like to dwell and should dwell up at the higher levels uh, where they're advising the politicians and they are uh, directing their theaters and their armies. Notice that the organizational level of leadership touches up to the strategic level and then down to the direct level of leadership, uh, which is necessary to think of core commanders in this regard. Uh, think of the, uh, uh, the army commanders also in this regard. In fact, Robert E. Lee, for instance, had to wear all three of these hats, and in some cases simultaneously, hence the burden on him at Gettysburg being so, so heavy. And then you have the direct leadership uh, which we think here uh, at the tactical level primarily. Uh, here you're thinking Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain or Louis Armistead, but I would also urge you to think in terms of core commanders because they too are operating at primarily the tactical level. So this primer on uh, strategic theory is important for us to help us understand why and how the famous duo of Lee and Jackson mattered so much for the Confederacy and indeed why we need to revisit it and what the significance of that revisitation may be for us today. What was the strategic situation up to the point of the Battle of Chancellorsville, uh, during which Stonewall Jackson will receive uh, what becomes his fatal wound? Well, it was the second full year of the war, uh, and uh, very clearly the uh, Union is winning the war in the West, the blockade of the southern ports is going extremely well, uh, and uh, the Confederate economic instrument is suffering as a result. And we know how bad the inflation was at this time. This was not lost on Lee and Jackson. They knew that uh, the clock was ticking against their country and that something quickly needed to be done. And they also particularly understood this because the West was perceived by both of them, and particularly Robert E. Lee, is as essentially uh, down, down and, and done. Uh, Lee, I argue in the book, made many uh, decisions about uh, his own army, not out of myopia, as some scholars have uh, tried to claim, uh, a Virginia myopia, but instead he looked at things strate strategically and realized that the West had, as they say, done, gone up the spout uh, by this time in the war and therefore he was reluctant to detach portions of his army out to the west over ramshackle, unreliable Confederate railroads. It would take a very long time to get those portions of his army out there, and then they might get used by, shall we say, generals less proficient than he. And uh, Lee was careful about saying such things, with Davis being from Mississippi, of course, but uh, I think that's the big reason that he was reluctant. It wasn't because he was just in love with Virginia. Jackson, for his part, understood too that the dime was going against the Confederacy, uh, and only in the Eastern Theater was the M going well. The Confederacy, I think we could agree, is slightly winning the war in the East. Uh, it is uh, doing better than what the Union Command team has put together up to this point in the war, uh, but it is not a slam dunk. There has not yet been a war-winning battle, the decisive campaign that could clinch the victory, that could break the Northern will, and ultimately uh, achieve the Confederate goal of independence. That has not yet occurred. Uh, Lee came close uh, after Second Manassas, but no cigars, we well know, at Antietam. A couple other things I would mention. The Emancipation Proclamation has influenced the instrument, the, the informational instrument of national power immensely by this point, particularly uh, as it regards the interface with the diplomatic instrument. Uh, 
And in this, I'm referring, of course, to how the Europeans have reacted to it. This has not only made a big effect on the war effort in uh, the United States, but also in how the French and the British are looking at the uh, respective causes. And because they had abolished slavery uh, in the 1830s, uh, the British and the French empires and their respective leaders, as you know, were very reluctant to jump in on the side of the Confederacy unless there had been some very, very good reason and their national interests could trump national values. We talk about this a lot at the War College, the clash between values and interests, which is nothing new. Uh, it's been going on since the founding of this country and indeed since uh, civilization began. Uh, and indeed, this is something that Lee and Jackson are aware of, uh, that they can't rely on any help from foreign powers. They must win the war themselves. And it, if it's going to be won, it must be done in the East, and it must be done quickly. The problem for the Army of Northern Virginia and the Lee Jackson duo, assisted by James Longstreet and James Ewell Brown Stort, uh, was that uh, this winter of 62 to 63 was very hard logistically on the uh, Confederate Army. It was a hungry winter, it was a harsh winter, as many of you know. And Lee had to detach two of his divisions and Longstreet himself to southeast Virginia to watch the Yankees there and also uh, to forge and gather supplies for the army, uh, which was encamped south of Fredericksburg after the victory at Fredericksburg over Ambrose Burnside. It was a hollow victory to Robert E. Lee. He had planned to do something about it, but could not. And the reason behind that is rather interesting. Uh, as I'm about to relate. So these two pictures, which are drawn from my book, represent familiar period photos from the battlefield of Antietam that I'm sure many of you have visited. If you've not, please do go there. It's a lovely battlefield. It's, it's worth every minute that you spend there. Very well preserved. Antietam was obviously not the goal of the two Confederate commanders here and, uh, and Longstreet. The Confederate command team had agreed after Second Manassas that they wanted to get into Pennsylvania. And indeed, uh, there was more to it than just getting into Pennsylvania. And I'll read a little quote here from none other than Major John Pelham of uh, Stort's Horse Artillery, who wrote his parents on the 4th of September, we whipped General Pope last week at Manassas. Now General Lee, is leading us into northern territory. Tomorrow, we'll cross the Potomac and enter Maryland. I understand that General Jackson wants to invade Pennsylvania in order to strike the coal mines and railroads so as to cripple the enemy's industry and transportation. If all goes well, I hope that the war will be over soon, and then we can all be together again. Now that quote encapsulates, I think, better than many of the other ones that I found in the book, what Stonewall Jackson wanted to do from the beginning of the war, which was bring a hard war into the North. A few authors have uh, discovered this uh, before I did, uh, Charlie Royster uh, in particular, uh, but uh, no one really understood what Jackson really wanted to do when he got into the North and embarked upon the hard war. And what he really wanted to do was destroy northern strategic means. There were three to four anthracite coal mines that existed to the east of Harrisburg in uh, modern-day Schuylkill, Schuylkill County, where there are still coal mines, and they supplied the bulk of the north's high-energy and high-efficiency burning coal, the anthracite coal. Uh, Jackson knew this because his topographical engineer, Jedediah Hotchkiss, had lived in the Lycans Valley near there before the war, and had uh, a job. And uh, he comes south before the Civil War and he brings this local information with him. And he told his boss, if we can get to those coal mines, we can cripple the northern war industry. Not only bring their factories to a halt, but we can stop their steamships that are blockading our southern ports. And we can also uh, probably do a great deal of damage to their ability to transport armies via locomotive into our heartland. Uh, Jackson latched on to this very early on, and on top of that, believed that 
the North needed, needed to feel what it was like to be a country at war. As early as 1861, he proposed getting into Pennsylvania and burning out factories, burning out railroads, uh, and essentially wrecking havoc, uh, just short, just short of making war on civilians. Robert E. Lee knew about this. It was a bit of a radical idea for him. And uh, it wasn't until Arlington was despoiled uh, and uh, the other Lee plantations had been plundered, one of them burned uh, during the Peninsula Campaign, that, as Elizabeth Brown Pryor says, Lee hardened his heart towards the North and believed that the hard war was necessary. And he started to believe that Jackson's ideas were right. It's pretty clear from the evidence that's available to us that when they got into Pennsylvania in 1862, they weren't just going to aim for Harrisburg and inflict a political defeat on Abraham Lincoln. They wanted to uh, inflict a strategic level economic disaster by burning out these coal mines. Now, that goal stayed in Robert E. Lee's mind because after the failure of this campaign, represented by these photos, they, of course, went into the Fredericksburg battle. And then after that, Robert E. Lee and Stonewall Jackson had a winter, a hard winter, but a winter nonetheless, to think about how to try for it again. And by this point, as I write in the book, Lee and Jackson had become fast friends. And why were they now such good friends? Well, part of it had to do with the fact that they had beaten these gentlemen. This is sort of the rogues gallery of Union leaders who fell to the Confederate command team. And many of them are familiar to you. If you can't read the names, you probably can recognize the faces. And uh, George B. McClellan and Fitz John Porter are up there, Ambrose Burnside, John Pope, uh, Joseph Hooker ultimately will fall too, despite his, uh, his uh, boasts to bag Bobby Lee and uh, Oliver Otis Howard, who receives the brunt of Jackson's flank attack at Chancellorsville, obviously. Well, the thing was that there was nothing that the Union Army of the Potomac had yet come up with that could match the great duo of Lee and Jackson, complemented by Longstreet and Stuart. Now, for the Longstreet lovers out there, let me say this. There's no question that Longstreet was Lee's number one up through the seven days where Jackson underperforms. There's no question he doesn't do well there. He was worn out from the Valley Campaign, actually fell asleep with a biscuit clenched in his teeth, if you can be believe that. Uh, and uh, I think that's an indication of his exhaustion. The maps weren't good. And you could come up with a litany of excuses, but the bottom line is that he didn't do well. Lee was concerned. This was not the victor of the Valley. This is somebody else. But then Jackson redeems himself to a degree with the Cedar Mountain Campaign, and then subsequently at Second Manassas, he does very well at Antietam. And after that, Lee then asks the Confederate Congress to appoint Jackson and Longstreet together to be uh, uh, promoted. And this is important. Longstreet got the higher date of rank, and Jackson the second, but they both got promoted at the same time. What does this mean? It means that Lee still regarded Longstreet very strongly. But during the winter of 1862 to 1863, Longstreet wasn't there. He was in Southeast Virginia on detached duty of those two divisions. And it was during that time that the Lee-Jackson relationship grew particularly close. Why was that? What was it that actually made them good friends? Well, the first thing was that they both believed in divine providence. Though Lee was an Episcopalian and Jackson was what we call blue light Presbyterian, they both understood Christianity from the providential perspective, which essentially says that God has created the world and he's watching over it. Everything happens based on his design. And uh, if something bad happens, it's because he's trying to teach humanity a lesson. Uh, and Jackson believed this a little more extremely than Lee did, but they were both providentialists. Uh, and Lee thought, uh, for instance, that uh, there was more leverage for human agency. Jackson believed almost everything was uh, preordained, a bit of a predestinationalist there. But this was not unusual. 
for the 19th century United States. Jackson's often portrayed as a crazy zealot. No, that's not true at all. He and Lee were probably only about a, a half an inch removed on the spectrum, if, if, if you think of the spectrum as uh, about six inches long, really not that far apart. They were joined on that spectrum by none other than Abraham Lincoln and Salmon P. Chase and Oliver Otis Howard, also strong providentialists. And so we see a duo that believe in essentially the same kind of Christianity, though they approach it from different denominations. And this allowed them to actually attend worship together in the camps outside of Fredericksburg several times before the spring campaign ignites. They had many social occasions together during that time and previously, and Longstreet wasn't there. And hence you see, just by default, Jackson and Lee getting closer. Another part of this important, uh, this important relationship was Jeb Stuart, who considered Stonewall Jackson, quote, the dearest friend I ever had, as he wrote uh, to Jackson's widow after Jackson's death. They were extremely tight. There is a reason that you see Stuart guiding Jackson's columns in many of the great campaigns prior to Chancellorsville and indeed during Chancellorsville itself. Those two men were tight. So there was a very strong second level of leadership in the Confederate command team that the Union could not yet match. And during that winter, while their personal relationship grew tight, strengthened by this underpinning of strong religious understanding, Lee and Jackson planned what became the Pennsylvania campaign. And I will just rehearse that one more time. They planned it together. It wasn't just Robert E. Lee's idea. They secreted them themselves for approximately three days in Lee's command tent in March, early March of 1863. And with them, they had a map drawn by Jedediah Hotchkiss, a map uh, which I will show you. Uh, it exists at the Hanley Library in Winchester, and there are copies of it at the National, uh, at the Library of Congress, rather. And that map is so detailed, it has farmsteads in Pennsylvania and Maryland delineated. How did they know this? Because Jackson's staff had sent spies up into southern Pennsylvania to map all of this out. They knew where all their supplies were going to come from. Now, it does end at the Susquehanna River, which begs the question, when the coal mines are on the other side, why didn't they go over there? I think it's because they couldn't get across the river, the spies, but I, that's my conjecture on that. But this map was with Lee and Jackson in Lee's command tent. For three straight days, they secret themselves away. And when Lee emerges, he goes to Richmond. There was a March conference in Richmond. It's not very well known. It's hard to find it. But if you triangulate the primary sources, you will find it. And it was there that Lee sells the idea of Pennsylvania to the Confederate command authority. It wasn't in May. That had already been sold to them. It was in March. Uh, they decide that this is the best of several options. Oh, that bottom picture, by the way, that's Moss Neck Manor. That's where Jackson's headquarters was. And you can uh, beg permission to visit it today. It's not open to the public, but uh, I understand they're very friendly if you, if you ask. So what were those three options? Well, some of those are familiar to us because they're essentially the same options that were discussed in uh, June and May of 1863. Obviously, one option is to do something about Vicksburg and the Mississippi. In, in March, it was not yet under siege, as we well know, but everybody knew in the Confederate uh, government in Richmond that Vicksburg was gonna be a problem uh, very soon. It was gonna have to be dealt with. Uh, and uh, so therefore, do we do something about the Mississippi theater? That's option one, strategically. Option two is to do something in Tennessee, reinforce Braxton Bragg's Army of Tennessee uh, a little bit closer if men were to be, ta to de be detached from the Army of Northern Virginia. Uh, but it's still going to take a while for them to get there, and will Bragg utilize them correctly? Uh, Lee actually uh, had some insinuations in some of his official letters, which you can find in the official records today, where he rather uh, remotely suggests that maybe they won't be well utilized there or in Mississippi. The first option was to go after Pennsylvania again, to try to get into the North for a second time. And he did succeed. 
Uh, and uh, Postmaster General Reagan uh, didn't like it then in March, and he didn't like it later in the later conferences. Uh, but Davis is sold on it in March and essentially gives Lee the go-ahead. The problem is that Robert E. Lee catches a cold while he's in Richmond. And here we see the great example of chance influencing Civil War history. We've heard about this so many times in so many campaigns, but I will tell you that it happened here at the worst possible strategic timing for the Confederacy, because Lee now will fall sick for about five weeks with the cold that he picked up in Richmond. And he will not recover from it before Joseph Hooker gets the jump on him operationally and sends the Army of the Potomac across the Rappahannock and the Rapidan Rivers to the west of Fredericksburg. And then everything starts to change because Lee must now react to what the Federals uh, are doing to him. But he wanted to be the one that initiated hostilities. He planned for the movement north to begin in April. Evidence of this it has existed in the official records for, for generations. It's there. A pon pontoon train was brought up and bridges were laid in the upper Rappahannock reaches. Uh, there were discussions uh, and indeed orders in Jackson's Corps about how to conduct rapid marches and specifically how many breaks within those rapid marches would be taken by the soldiers. This is all done in March and April of 1863 but it's arrested because Lee falls sick. Jackson was just chomping at the bit, but there was nothing he could do. And then suddenly he gets the order to move out on the first. Now we know what happens uh, and uh, Chancellorsville is going to be a great blow with the loss of Jackson. So to sum up what was the Lee-Jackson relationship on the 1st of May, 1863, the beginning of the Chancellorsville campaign, well, uh, Jackson is Lee's chief strategic advisor. He's also one of his very good friends. Lee had a few other friends in the Army, William Nelson Pendleton being one of them. Longstreet thought that he was good friends with Robert E. Lee. I think that's a post-war concoction, but that's my opinion, and I've been accused of being a Jacksonite there, so mea culpa on that. Uh, but uh, perhaps it was also James Longstreet. The point is that they were very close, and with Jackson's death, Lee is going to be quite broken up also, uh, you will see that uh, uh, Lee and Jackson together had thought about how to win this war. Uh, if they could get into Pennsylvania, they could wreck things logistically. Uh, they could destroy northern means, which would then affect, affect the ability of the North to prosecute the war and achieve its uh, national policy goal of reunion. Uh, this is strategic level thinking, and Stonewall Jackson is thinking this. It isn't just something Lee came up with. Uh, this is a Jackson-level thought, and it did influence Robert E. Lee's thinking. There is also a strong Christian faith and a very strong uh, belief in God. Uh, they, as providentialists, believe God will bless this venture or it will not. And if it does not, well, then they're being told something and they need to reform. And all the providentialists of the 19th century thought this, uh, thought this as well. And then lastly, uh, Stuart and Jackson are quite close, which created a second tier of leadership underneath Robert E. Lee that was extremely effective. Longstreet not here, he is still in Southeast Virginia and will not get back in time for the Chancellorsville campaign. What was Jackson's wider significance for the Confederacy? Well, by this time, he was not only seen as the hero of the Valley because of what he had done in the Valley Campaign of 62, but he was recognized by the general Confederate public for his significance to Lee and the command team that had won so many victories. And he was also understood by the Confederate government after a rather prickly initial relationship with Jefferson Davis as indispensable. And so his reputation in the government was rising. Virginians saw him as the savior of the valley and indeed of, of uh, Virginia itself. And his reputation was national. It was not just in Virginia, but throughout the South. He was seen as a symbol of the righteousness of the cause. And this was a problem because uh, as some of his eulogists would write later after his death, all throughout the Confederacy, they had put their faith in a pillar of flesh and now they were 
being forced to pay for that. Uh, but up to this point, by the 1st of May, 1863, there was a belief that Jackson represented the righteousness of the cause because he was such a Christian. Well, we well know that it's not going to be. He will be shot by his own men accidentally on the evening of the 2nd, reconnoitering in front of his own lines, something he had done many times, in the aftermath of his victorious uh, flank attack on the Union Army. He and Lee had planned to uh, do a great deal of damage to the Union Army. I think they knew they probably couldn't destroy it, but what they wanted to do was badly damage it. Very serious uh, type defeat, uh, not unlike Marlboro in the 17th century over in Europe. Uh, one that could possibly be a war-winning stroke, but maybe not quite so extreme. Uh, Jackson was probably thinking about having to stop the attack because of night when he's accidentally shot. And we all know the famous quote that Lee says, uh, Jackson has lost his left arm, but I've lost my right. And indeed, it was far more than that because now Lee has lost his co-planner and organizer for the movement north as well as a very good friend and an operational uh, lieutenant. It was an immense loss for Lee and for the Army of Northern Virginia. There's the Hotchkiss map on the bottom uh, for anyone who's interested. It's extremely detailed. So why was this a strategic contingency point? Why was this one of those moments in the Civil War where it changed? I believe with Jim McPherson, there were approximately four periods of time where the war shifted. Uh, I would add that this is one of them, uh, or it's a major subpoint to the summer of 1863, which Jim identified many years ago, because the reactions to Jackson's death throughout the South were incredibly, incredibly heartfelt. It wasn't just in Virginia, it wasn't just in the Richmond newspapers, it was also as far south as Mobile and as far west as Houston, Texas. Even little children recognized what the death of Jackson represented and called forth uh, on God to support them. One of the most, I think, telltale signs that this was a national level event was Jefferson Davis's own reaction, who said, quote, this is a national calamity. Now, when the president of a country says something's a national calamity, you should wake up and notice it. Uh, that is repeated, by the way, in many of the major southern papers all throughout the secessionist South. Uh, and there is a belief in the Army of Northern Virginia that Lee's command team was now irreparably damaged and that it would not recover. So the soldiers in the ranks also believed this. There were some exceptions. There was some stoicism. Interestingly, Jedediah Hotchkiss was one of them. He said, well, Jackson fell, and that's bad, but we will carry on. Rather interesting. Hotchkiss's letters are just a, a wonder to read, but you have to be careful because some of them are written with the lost cause. Interestingly, also in England, there was a reaction. Uh, and the British realized that this was uh, probably one of the most fatal shots of the war to the Confederates, which was a quote in one of the British newspapers. And Abraham Lincoln himself would say, uh, in response to a eulogy written in the Washington Morning Chronicle, uh, I believe that, that General Jackson was a good man and I thank you for this eulogy, he wrote to the editor that, uh, that you put in there when Lincoln gives a tribute. And uh, Oliver Otis Howard wrote after the war, after Jackson's death, General Lee could not replace him. Lee himself was the most profoundly affected. He went into his tent and wept. Now how many times can we chronicle this? Almost never, but we know because William Nelson Pendleton, who was also a friend of Jackson's, was there with him and wept together with Robert E. Lee. That was how profound the damage was to Lee personally, and I think Lee wept for his army and for its prospects as well, knowing that now they had clinched the initiative uh, operationally from the Federals, and in their theater they were going to have to do something with it, but Jackson would not be with them. And so the great reorganization. If you want a very basic so what, why we care about Jackson's death historically, this is it. Now I would urge you to not just think, oh, Richard Yule and A.P. Hill weren't Jackson. Think about the fact that there was a week and a half 
for them to get accustomed to their more senior level of command before the Confederate Army moves north. Think about the fact that Richard Yule had been out of the Army for nine months on convalescent leave and had recently, as a confirmed bachelor, married his cousin, whose, in, whose name was Lysenka, interestingly, uh, and uh, uh, now would inherit Jackson's staff, which was still loyal to Jackson. Think also about the lack of time that Robert E. Lee had to counsel Hill and Yule. We have one very sketchy piece of evidence that he counseled Yule, and none whatsoever that he counseled Hill prior to the movement north. And then finally, think about Lee's ability to change his famous mission command method of giving orders, an intent-based order style. Uh, not unlike how our commanders today give their orders, he and Jackson had this understanding. He and Longstreet had this understanding. To a degree, he had it with Stuart. He does not have that with Ewell and Hill. He didn't have time to change his method of command. And that, folks, will be a very large chicken that will come home to roost here at Gettysburg. And so Jackson will go, replaced there as a, by a common soldier. And the movement north will commence without the partner in command with whom Robert E. Lee planned this entire campaign. Thank you very much. For a more in-depth discussion with this speaker, go to patreon.com slash addressing Gettysburg.